Uh, there is no way anybody could be that important. <laughs> uh, certainly not me. Uh, as far as changing, I'll tell you something I changed immediately. Uh, we did the old loose ball drill in 75 by me demonstrating. In 79, I did the same drill, went over the ball, knocked myself out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. And I got up and turned and faced the stage, and I thought, gosh, I'm in a strange place. <laughs> That's the last time I did that. I changed. <laughs> now, another thing that uh, I want to comment on is my jacket. <laughs> uh, Paige Moyer's back here. Uh, I got the jacket about, well, it was a suit. It was a suit, and I got the suit three years, Paige, before you got married. You remember I went to your wedding? How long have you been married? How much? 24 years. Okay, it's only 27 years old. The other thing I want to say at this particular time is this. I want to introduce my family. Uh, I'm doing this because when my, before my mother died, she said, I don't know if you know it or not, Biggs, that was my nickname at home, uh, the Eretz are dwindling. Uh, there's not many left. She said, we have a little set out there in Yuba City, California. Uh, we got some in Covington, Virginia. There's not many left. So of the ones left, I want to introduce them now. I want them to get up. All the Eretz are those associated with the Eretz. Please stand up. All right. You can sit down. Now, another thing I want to do quickly here is this, and some of you know this. I, I've gone through some hard times here. One of the hard times I always go through is this microphone. <laughs> Don't ever say P. <laughs> anyway, I've, I've gone through some hard times, and uh, it, it sort of turned out like this. I was shaving one day. I was having such a good day. It was a sunny day. It was in the fall of the year. I took my blade and went down through my chin, and all of a sudden I hit something right there below my chin bone. And I thought, you know, that, that doesn't feel right. And I looked at that, and I rubbed my finger there, and I said this to myself, lymphoma. And I didn't pay too much attention to it until I went to the local doctor, and I had him take a look at it. And he said, no, I don't think there's anything serious about that. He said, as a matter of fact, your test came back, and you're more healthy than you've ever been. And I was satisfied with that. And... Uh, I didn't think any more about it until I took Ms. Eric back out to see him. She'd fallen on a chair or something like that. And I said, what do you think of that now? And he said, yeah, you need to go see a doctor. You need to go see University of Virginia, uh, a doctor, see what he says about it. So I went, and they did a little biopsy, and I didn't think too much of it. And I had to come back the next week, and they said to me, uh, you have cancer. You have lymphoma. That's not a very nice thing to hear. Not very nice at all. And they said, uh, we'll do a body scan. They did a body scan, and then he came back with this, which I didn't like too much either. He said, you've got aggressive lymphoma. We're going to give you six chemo treatments uh, three weeks in between. But you've got some other stuff in there we don't know about. We've got some stuff there that we may or may not fix. I didn't think that sounded very good either. And so uh, I took my chemo, and it went January, February, March, April, May, and I went back last Wednesday, not yesterday, but last Wednesday. And I got a scan, and I met the doctor. And I was shocked by what he said. He said, you know, I'm going to tell you something that I didn't necessarily believe. You don't have anything in you. There's no cancer in you. 
And I thought, that doesn't sound right. He said, there's none there. And I couldn't really believe it. It probably was the happiest day of my life. And I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this because I can't tell you the number of people that have told me that they had prayed for me. You see, Fork Union is a Christian school. And Christian people pray for others. The faculty here prays for you. Uh, the surrounding community prays for you. Uh, the journeying counties pray for you. And then I can't tell you, uh, John Aver, I can't tell you the number of coaches that have sent me letters about praying for me during this tragic situation that I happen to be in. Now, I tell you that because I want to say more about this business of prayer. You see, uh, Fort Union's a Christian place. And one of the things that the old general wanted you to do was read scripture each day to your class. And I happened to pick the book of John. Now, this is a true story. The general was here 17 years. I had four classes in those 17 years. I would read orally the book of John four times a year for 17 years. So I read that thing 68 times. And you know something? I'd already been here 30 years. But here's a message that, here's a message that I read. Now listen to this. But if you stay joined to me and my words remain in you, you may ask any request you like and it will be granted. We read that 68 times. But if you stay joined to me and my words remain in you, you may ask any request you like and it will be granted. You see, the thing I see about Fork Union people is that they believe in that, they put their faith in that, and then they do that. And I'm telling you right now, I'm telling all of you, and I'm not going to ask you who prayed for me because I know there's many in here. I thank you from the bottom of my heart because I totally believe that your prayer put me in the situation where I am right today. You see, I didn't know whether, honestly, at many times, whether I'd be standing here. Even though after I was voted in the Hall of Fame, I didn't know if I'd ever make it. So I want to thank you for that. That's the first thing I want to say. Second thing I want to say is this. It was the happiest day of my life. I cannot tell you how thrilled I was when I heard that. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't really the best time of my life because uh, that happened some time ago. And that's a crazy something also. See, my first job after I got and left Fork Union, went to the University of Virginia, I graduated, I went to Manassas, Virginia, and I taught biology at Stonewall Jackson High School, and Mrs. Errett, who was then B.J. Hauser, Betty Jean Hauser, taught elementary school. So one day, she wanted to go home in Lynchburg, and we got in the car, and we started driving toward Lynchburg, and I said, hey, why are we, why are we doing this? Why don't we go through Fork Union so I can see Coach Miller? I have, a lot of, uh, I have a lot of respect for Coach Miller, so I want to go see him. So anyway, we drove to Fork Union, and we drove in his driveway and knocked on his door, and they received us. We talked a while, and he said, hey, don't you teach biology? I said, yeah, I teach biology at Stonewall Jackson High School in Manan. He said, you know, we need a biology teacher. I said, you do? He said, yeah. Would you be interested? I said, yeah, I'll be interested. So, he said, let's go up and see Colonel Wicker right now. Colonel Wicker was in his 70s at that particular time. I think he was an old World War I pilot. You know, with the open seats and the scarf going by. So, we went up to see uh, Colonel Wicker, and he said, uh, he said, uh, yeah, I, I know who you are. And 
Coach Miller said, well, listen, uh, Colonel, he came out to talk to you about a job. He said he did. Uh, he's a biology teacher. And he, the Colonel said, well, if I'm not mistaken, you used to play a little basketball here. I said, that's right, a couple, three years ago. He said, well, boy, and he called everybody a boy. He said, boy, I'll tell you what, I remember you a couple of times, and he said, I'd like to have you on the staff. I want to offer you a job right now as a biology teacher. And he said, I want to give you $4,500 a year. <laughs> he said, what do you think? I said, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> because I love Fork Union at that particular time. I was in Stonewall, Jackson, and Manassas. I didn't need any of that now. So I took the job, and here's the thing that happened next. I got in the car with Coach Miller, and we were parked in front of the Hatcher Hall steps, and we drove around the circle. And we were driving around the circle, and then we pulled right past the chapel, you know exactly what I'm talking, and we went left, down where the tennis courts are. And as we traveled around the circle, he said, listen, this ain't no place for a single man now. He said, uh, this is not the place to be. He said, Charlottesville's a long way off. Richmond's a long way off. Uh, are, are you serious any at all about that girl you were with? <laughs> I said, yeah, I, I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> so we got down. We, we passed the tennis courts and got down in the, the dip there. And I thought, man, there's a lot of pressure on me. <laughs> So we drove up the slope, and you know, a lot of you here have gone to the crossroads and back, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We drove up the slope toward faculty housing. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe this is the time. <laughs> so we drove in the driveway and parked, and I got out, went inside, and I said, BJ, uh, will you come outside a minute? <laughs> and, and she's not very emotional. She's not very emotional at all. She said, yes. <laughs> so uh, we're out in the driveway, and I even think it was a basket overhead. And I said, uh, BJ, uh, have you ever thought about getting married? She said, yes. I thought, uh, I said, uh, uh, have you ever thought about marrying me? <laughs> and she said, yes. <laughs> and then I said, will you marry me? She said, yes. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> Let's go back inside. So we went back inside, and Miller says, Coach Miller said, listen, if you're getting married, you've got to go up and get a place to stay. You've got to get in the car and run up there and see Colonel Wecker again. <laughs> and so I did. And he said, yeah, boy, I, I'll, I'll give you some room. I'll give you housing. He said, you can stay in Oak Ridge in an apartment. I said, that's good enough for me. And that's how I got to Fork Union. And here's why it's the best day of my life. I got a job that I wanted. I got a woman that I wanted. <laughs> and I didn't even know it. I got a career. And I've never regretted one bit of that career to this day. Because Fork Union is a special place. A special place. I told my roommate, uh, Chip Connor, the other day, we, we roomed together at University of Virginia. I said, this is a place where kids will do what they're supposed to do. And I said, in today's society, isn't that a hard thing to find any place? It sort of reminds me, I got this out of the Daily Bread. Listen to this. Here's what Fork Union really is. As the story goes, a piece of wood once barely complained because its owner kept whittling away at it, gouging and making holes in it. But the one who was cutting it paid no attention to the stick's protest. He was making a flute out of a beautiful piece of ebony. 
and he was too wise to stop when the wood totally complained constantly. The man said, look, little piece of wood, without these rifts and holes and all this cutting, you'd be just another stick forever, a useless piece of nothing. What I am doing now may seem as if I am destroying you, but instead it will change you into a flute. Your sweet music will charm the souls of men and comfort soaring hearts. My cutting you is the making of you. For only thus can you be a blessing in the world. I thought, what a great story. It is a picture of what Fourth Union is about. Because it is a very difficult thing to do. To come in here and do the things that we ask you to do. There's all kinds of groaning and moaning and whining and pining and growling and howling about everything you ask them to do in any area. And I'm going to tell you this real quick. There's five things that Fork Union has that are different than anybody else. I want you to think about this and I want you to carry it to those around you because this is true. Number one, it is a Christian school where you can read scripture. You know, you can say, thou really should not steal. And I asked my good roommate today, I said, does anybody want their car stolen tonight, their Mercedes? So that's a value you can teach. Can you teach values everywhere? No, you can't do that. Only here, based on biblical principle. Number two, here's another thing. They moan and groan. You've got to get your hair cut. You've got to get a shave. You've got to wax the floor. You've got to make your bread. You've got, you got to get to class on time. That's terrible for some of them. Terrible. I had a guy come in uh, my classroom right at the end of the year. Had a pair of golf socks on. I said, hey, Christian, why well, you got golf socks? I got to wear box socks. Why don't you have socks? Go get them. If you don't like it, don't come back. Where else can you do that here? Listen to this. Number three, the one subject plan. Don't let anybody fool you. It's the best in the business. How would anybody know better than me? I've done it 46 years. Listen, I taught at Stonewall Jackson in high school. It would take you, it would take you 30 minutes to get them settled down and get the roll. Here, you've got them all day. And I like it because of this. See, I, I'm, I'm in uh, biology. I teach genetics. I got some guys that don't go as fast as others, so I'm teaching them. So I make sure before they come in that they have a library book. I send them over to Ms. Armstrong, get a library book. And they can read while I'm catching everybody else up. That's the one subject plan. I think it's a wonderful plan. Four, the CQ period, I don't care what anybody said, is still unbelievable. You can go any dorm, drop a pen. It's so much better talking without that. Guy. Drop a pen and you can hear it. Now, if you don't hear it, that means somebody's talking. That means somebody's going to put, on, put you on report and that means you're going to walk tours possibly. And I don't know if you know anything about a tour, but that's not a very nice thing. You walk, I mean, even Mrs. Ayer says, you mean they walk 50 minutes and then take a 10 minute break? Then they gotta walk another 50? I said, yeah, yeah. That's another wonderful thing. And the last thing I'm gonna say is this, real quick, that, that, I, I've been here a long time now, I've seen a lot of stuff. I have seen a Division I, athlete recruited out of every sport at Fork Union. We talked about Clark in tennis. I've seen it in baseball. I've seen it in wrestling. I've seen it in golf. We had a guy named Mark Houston that played at Houston. I've seen a Division I athlete in every sport. Now you think about those five things I've just said. You cannot top Fork Union with any school that I know. I love it here. 
most of all because of the people. So those are things I want you to hear from me because I've been here a long time. Uh, it sort of reminds me of the walrus and Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I weep with you, the walrus says. I deeply sympathize. With tears and sobs, he sorted out the clams of larger size. In other words, if they can't do it, we've got to do something with them. We've got to send them home. As Colonel Pulliam used to say, uh, the toads of larger size. But that's what makes Fork Union special. You see, if they don't live up to the capability, they're not going to be here too long. As a matter of fact, we had a great basketball player a couple years ago. He was walking tours two weeks before we had the tournament. And he came to me breathlessly and said, Coach, guess what? I can play tonight. I said, play tonight for who? <laughs> I said, you ain't playing for me. <laughs> he thought he was going to play, walk tours like he did, and I'd do something he wanted to do in high school and then come forward and play. No, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> Last thing I want to tell you is this. The basketball job at Fork Union is the best job in the world. Now, I'm telling you this. I know I only make $1,500 coaching basketball, and Krzyzewski makes close to $4 million. He and Roy Williams. But I wouldn't trade that with, I wouldn't trade them for anything in the world. Why? Because of the stuff they got to put up with. Fork Union, listen to this. No press. Nobody comes up here and bothers me about, hey, coach, what you going to do next week? <laughs> or how about this one? You'll love this one. The NBA, you know how the female runs out with the microphone and says, coach, I, I know you're down 50 points. You've got five minutes to go. What are you going to do? Well, we're going to make 25 layups and then make a foul shot and we'll win. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> but anyway, it's a wonderful situation to be in. There's no parents that bother you. See, the thing, of they all come try out. If you've got a parent that's talking too much, you just don't take the kid. <laughs> I mean, we can get somebody else. We don't have to take that kid. <laughs> and then, how about this? You'll love this. How about the posse? The posse. That's an AAU bunch. That's what I call them. They sort of take, you don't, you don't have to fool with them. And then there's no phones. There's no cell. You know, I've I had coaches say, as soon as they get to the dressing room, if they don't get enough playing time, they call their parents and say, take me out of school and send me someplace else. I didn't get any playing time. No, no phones. No phones. So those are things that make Fort Union a little different. And the last thing is this, and I think you'll enjoy this. You know what else we don't have? There's no perfume. <laughs> you don't have to worry about their girlfriends. <laughs> so all those things to me makes this school what it is. It is a special place. I want you to know that. Because the people here are the nicest people in the world. And I love every one of them. And I'm going to quit now because I've already talked too long. And I'm going to tell you this. God bless you. God bless Fork Union. And God bless those that serve in the military for the United States of America. Thank you. <laughs>